It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with The Mixed Martial Arts Hour back in your life on this Monday, May 2nd, 2016. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani inside our New York City studio. It is great to be here on a rainy Monday afternoon. I was just in Montreal less than 24 hours ago. I went to Montreal after last week's show. It was great to be home. I got to celebrate my my son Oliver's fourth birthday. It was wonderful being there with friends and family. But now it is back to reality, back doing this show, and I am very happy to be here. And, and you know what I was happy about last week? It was a relatively quiet week in the world of MMA. Now, you know, we're a little spoiled um, as far as those who cover the sport. There's always a lot going on. And lest we forget that the UFC 200 main event was officially announced in the weirdest way possible. It was announced early Wednesday morning on Good Morning America of all places. And, and, and we'll talk about this later on in the show. I kind of feel like this was this was a bit of a fumble. I mean, how many people watching Good Morning America on that Wednesday morning are actually going to watch the pay-per-view, buy the pay-per-view on July 9th? How many people learned more about the UFC, got got more into the UFC, learned more about John Jones and Daniel Cormier? To me, it is much more valuable to go on a sports center or any other kind of sports show to do it. But, you know, it's a milestone for the UFC and somewhat ironic that they did it on a platform like that after Conor McGregor who's been tweeting up a storm this morning after Conor McGregor went on and, and, and said, you know, less than two weeks ago that he was tired of doing the Tim and Susie show. That is the Tim and Susie show, with all due respect. I mean, did, did you watch it? And I love Good Morning America. Jesse Palmer, he's a great Canadian boy. But let's call it like we see it. Speaking of Conor, yes, I get a lot of people asking me, have you reached out to Conor McGregor? I mean, don't, don't you know me by now? Of course I have. Um, he, he put out a, a tweet just moments ago, you know, call me no press, more press. He's not in the mood to talk to the press. And, and, and I get it. This story continues to evolve. It's become a saga. The UFC seems to have moved on. It's now John Jones versus Daniel Cormier. That's the new main event for UFC 200. And later on in the program, we are not joined this week by the great New York Rick. He is on, as I said last week, his 48th honeymoon. I, I really, I, I mean, I'm being honest here. It, it is literally his third. Okay, I'm exaggerating when I say 48, but literally I think it's his third honeymoon since tying the knot to his beautiful bride. Um, but this train continues to move along. In fact, all our ducks were in order. Everything was aligned. I mean, we were, we were, I was sitting here for 30 minutes doing nothing because everyone brought their A game. Uh, New York Rick uh, being replaced in the back by Adam, who is killing him as far as prep is concerned. So I, I just want to put that out there. New York Rick, enjoy your time. But this train moves along without you. So you can have your Mai Tais on the beach in Honolulu. But we, we got a show to do, my friends, and we have a lot to discuss. So later on in the show, usually I go back and forth with uh, New York Rick, uh, questions, comments, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the man in the hat, Chuck Mindenhall will stop by and he will shoot the breeze with me. By the way, the man in the hat responsible for this MMA beat shirt that you see above my right shoulder. I'm told a handful are left. A tremendous cause it is going to, uh, all proceeds are going to the Higher, Higher Heroes Fund, which is uh, headed up by the great Brian Stan. It, in short, ensures that veterans find work and uh, are able to seamlessly transition back into regular life after serving this great country. So all proceeds going to Hire Heroes. Great, great foundation. We're happy to be a part of it and do a little, little tiny part. So there you have it, the MMA Beach shirt. You can get it over at MMAWarehouse.com. Okay, what are we talking about today? A lot going on. At 2.45, we're going to be joined by the Black Zillions boss, Glenn Robinson, Horrible news yesterday out of Florida. Jordan Parsons, young fighter for Bellator, involved in a hit-and-run accident, and uh, it appears as though his his career is over. But that's you know that, that's the least important of this news. He is in critical condition. Want to talk to Glenn Robinson about him? Get an update on Jordan Parsons. We are definitely thinking about him as we do this show and wish him the very best. Joanne Calderwood will stop by. She got some good news last week. She's fighting Valérie Le Tourneau. In Ottawa, June 18th, in the first official UFC women's flyweight fight. How about that? JoJo is back against Valerie Letourneau. 
Exciting. Uh, 205, speaking of women's MMA, Tiffany Van Sust. You may not be familiar with her if you're just an MMA fan, but she is a star when it comes to Muay Thai kickboxing. Recently signed with Glory and Invicta. Want to talk to her? Time bomb in the house. Uh, 145, we'll talk to Neil Magny. Coming off that big win over Hector Lombard, recently signed a new contract with the UFC. So we'll talk to him. First time Neil Magny's on this program. 125, we're going to talk to Gunnar Nelson about his fight this Sunday. In Rotterdam, he's fighting Albert Tumanov. But first, let us go to the Skype machine and welcome in our first guest of the day. He is coming off a big win at UFC 197 and got some great news on Friday because he is coming to LA. I should be exact. He is coming to Inglewood, California at uh, UFC 199 June 4th. James Vick will be fighting Evan Dunn and replacing the injured Leo Santos. This man is blazing hot and he actually called me out last week and I loved it. James Vick joining us now on the program. James, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great, my friend. So, yes, I'm on my Twitter last week, and James Vick calls me out, says, Ariel, when am I going to get on this show? Is it only for the cool kids? Or I think you said, am I not part of the cool kids club? Something to that effect. Were you not feeling the love? Is that is that what's going on here? I wasn't feeling it. I, I sensed a little, um, when, when we did the interview after after my last fight, I sensed maybe, maybe you were you were starting to get on the bandwagon. So <laughs> I figured I'd call you out and give you an opportunity before it left town. Okay, fair enough. Well, I got to say, I, I appreciated it. And here you are. So once again in MMA, the uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease. I, I, I love that. Um, so it's interesting because when we spoke after your win at UFC 197, you improved to 9-0. You were adamant. You wanted Michael Chiesa next. You did not get him. You got Evan Dunham. Are you disappointed that you got Dunham? I'm not at all. Uh, I, I knew that I wasn't getting Chiesa anyway, not the next fight, because he just come off such a big win over the number eight ranked guy. So I, I just feel blessed that I got into the top 15. I win this fight. Now I'm, ring, I, I'm taking his spot at number 14. Evan Dunham is a, a solid veteran. He's been around for a long time and – um, it's going to be a good fight. You know, I think, you know, I definitely think I'm going to win. I think I'm going to win easily. And, um, I'm moving up 15, basically 15 spots in the ranking. So, so I'm not, I'm not disappointed at all. I'm, I'm thrilled to death. When you say easily, what, what comes to mind? Uh, how, how easy is this fight going to be in your opinion? I mean, I, I'm obviously, I'm going to try to finish him. I'm going to go for the finish, but if it doesn't present itself, I think that I'm going to win this, this, this thing handily a decision. I think that, um, I, all I got to do is basically the same thing I did my last fight, and he, he's not going to be able to take me down. He's not going to be able to hold me down. My, my jiu-jitsu is good enough that I'm not really worried about any of these guys taking me down, and I can get up all, you know, pretty much any time I want. If you you know, you know saw my last fight, the yeah. guy took me down, but all he was holding me. I landed more strikes from the bottom than he did from the top, and I think that there's no way this guy's going to outstrike me, so I, I see myself either winning an easy unanimous decision or, or catch, catching him with something and, and getting a finish. Now, the notable thing here for me is you're coming back a month and a half after your, your last fight at UFC 197. You have been, you know, for lack of a better term, plagued by injuries. You, you take these long breaks and sometimes you are forgotten about. Are you healthy? No problems after 197? Yeah, absolutely. 100% healthy. And that, that was the, you know, the deciding factor is, is I... I uh, I was healthy, and I'm, you know this is the career-changing opportunity for me to break into the top 15. And he, he, he I got the email about 10 o'clock at night on Thursday, and and I got back to him by Friday morning and told him I'll take the fight for sure. And everything worked out good, and I, I'm ready to go. I I fought 15 minutes, you know, eight days ago, nine days ago. I, I'm in shape right now. I didn't get out of shape. I didn't really take any damage. So so I'm back to training. I already did a two-hour session this morning. I'm going to train again tonight, and then I'm. I'm here at my home gym in, in Fort Worth, Texas, um, failing some MMA, and then I'm heading back to Team Lloyd Irvin uh, Wednesday in Maryland for, my, so, for the rest of my camp. I noticed on April 28th, so that would be uh, Thursday, yeah, you, you tweeted Dana White. You said, thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you what you did recently. Were you referring to getting that fight? No, that was something else that um, – uh, just something else – you know, oh. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, that's it no was, fun. You got to come on the show and talk about things. We can't keep secrets. We're buddies now. Well, they, they, the, the UFC helped me out with uh, a couple of things. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to discuss it, so I don't want to. Okay. Sorry, man. I don't know if I'm <laughs> Fair enough. But they're treating you well, basically. You're happy with them. I'm, I'm, I'm happy as can be with the UFC right now. I, I'm living the dream. I feel so blessed. 
So, so here we are, um, and like I said, a month and a half later, and you're getting this fight. Do you feel like you're finally over that hump? Because to me, again, it's amazing. You're 9-0. You've had five fights in the UFC, but you've been in the UFC for three years. And a lot of these tough live guys that, you know, you were part of that season, they've come and gone. They've had, you know, these runs. Kesa's doing great. Crookshank's out of the UFC. I mean, but a lot, you look at that, that, that cast... A lot of them went on to the UFC. Some have had full careers in the UFC and have recently got cut, things like that. You, it feels like you never even got started in a weird way. Like you're the, the sort of the forgotten member of that cast. Do you feel like you're over that hump now? Like now your, your career is about to really start in the UFC. You're going to go on a run here? For sure. Um, I, I really, my goal with the start of the year was to get three fights and to break into the top 10. So it's, I think it's about to happen. I'm going to win. I'm going to win on June the 4th and be number 14. And then hopefully by the end of the year, I get another fight and, and get, get put in the top 10. And then from there, it's, you know, I, I have another year in my mind. I, I have a goal to within the next two years, I'll be a world champion and everything's came, came together for me. It was, a, you know, a lot of hard times with the injuries and stuff, but the good thing is I wasn't injured that whole time. I've had a lot of time in between fights, just a lot of bad timing with certain things where they kept me out of the ring longer too, where I would have smaller injuries come up after a surgery or something. I, I, I pulled my groin and then I had to, you know, wait another five, six weeks, but I've progressed a lot in between the time period. I think a lot of the guys, they had great, they've, a lot of them have had great careers in the UFC, but they <laughs> also been cut. It's almost like they try to take too many fights too soon. Hmm. And I was building a for myself. And now I think my skill set is up to par enough. I can fight with anybody in the world and, and, and do good and win. So I, it was a blessing and a curse at the same time, but I'm ready to go now. And I think I can fight anybody in the world. How frustrating was it to watch those guys that you were in the house with, you know, get big fights on big stages. And, you know, you're, like I said, you're, you're not being discussed in the, in the same conversation as them, even though your resume and your talent is very much on par, if not better than them. It was frustrating. I mean, I, you know, I, I was really close with a lot of guys in the house, so I was happy for them as well. I wasn't, you know, I'm definitely not a hater or anything uh -huh. from that perspective. But I, it was frustrating knowing that, basically seeing all these guys, knowing that I can beat these guys, and I'm over here broke working a full-time job half, you know, half the time I'm in the UFC because I can't, I'm not healthy enough to fight and make money. So, that you know, it, it was definitely frustrating, but I knew that, like we talked about in my interview after the fight, you know, I, I believe my my des it's my destiny to be a world champion, and my destiny can be delayed, but it can't be it can't be stopped. Mm. What, what was that job? Man, I was I was working while well, I was been teaching private lessons. I, I I coached at the UFC gym. I bounced at multiple clubs. I did a lot of you know a lot of club work where I was security and stuff. And mm. and it, it, it I mean it, it wasn't a bad job per se, but you know I don't want to be up till three in the morning doing a job I really don't want to do. I really just want to get up and practice full time. And now this after I got that bonus last fight against Jake Matthews, I was able to. Now granted, I didn't fight for a year, so I I kind of you know basically went broke again because. You know, Australia took so much money and taxes out of my out of my bonus, and, um, but uh, I was able to train full time. I, I had the, the hip surgery, but I could start. I started boxing again after about a month and a half after hip surgery, and then I could train full time within about four months after that. So I still had a solid probably five six months of, of training when I when I wasn't fighting after the surgery. So I, and I was training full time twice a day. I don't really I don't really just do camp. You know, I train year round twice a day as much as I can. So I, I progress my skill set a lot. So this this last year has really helped me after the surgery because I had enough money where I didn't have to work and I just trained full time. Now when you say broke, I mean how broke is broke? Are, are we talking like zero dollars here? Not not zero dollars, but um, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't make much money. I didn't make as much money on the Australia fight as people think. You know, I, they took sixteen thousand dollars out of that bonus, and then my purse wasn't that great. You know, you know, then um, I've, I've, I've recently, you know, got a better deal. But um, uh, I, uh, so you know, I, I made about fifty G's in that fight. But then you don't fight for a year straight, you know, and then you you got to pay taxes, you got to pay your coaches. Yeah, you, you know, you have to pay. All this different stuff, it, it, it you know, and then eleven and a half months of no, no fighting, it, you know, with no job. But I, I'm real, very frugal with my money. I just save, you know, I'm real cheap, so I save my money. So it, it lasted me, you know, it lasted me the whole year. I mean, I'm not, I wasn't completely broke, but I was down to right. I needed to fight. Again. Sure, if not, I was going to end up having to go back to work. Well, so back in the day when I used to frequent the the clubs, you know, I used to be a, a big club goer, believe it or not. Um, the bouncers were like these big roided up guys. You don't look like those guys. Do people try to step to you and then find out shortly that you're a UFC fighter and you can kick their ass with like one punch? Th does that ever happen? Because you look unassuming at, at first glance, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, one, one thing that helps me is I, I am skinny, but I'm tall. I'm 6'3", so that, that helps right. somewhat. 
But um, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of rough bouncing stories. I've, I've usually it's kind of funny because usually when I, I was if I if I'm taking someone out from inside the club, I always go for the neck. I grab the neck and I, I squeeze it a little. Until they stop fighting, and then when they stop fighting, I'll drag them out. You know, I'll, I'll go rear naked and I'll switch it to the to the side headlock. Wow, the bulldog chair. And then I'll take them out, or we get outside. A lot of the times, the clubs I worked at, we once we got them outside, a couple guys, I, I, I try not to hit them, you know, directly if if, we, if it came to that, because you know I, you don't want to break your hands, you don't want lawsuits. So it's kind of funny, but I would leg kick a lot of people. I've leg kicked several people. Oh. You know, it usually takes one leg kick and it's over because you know who's who's used to getting kicked in the thigh if they're a regular person, you know. Wow. And and we also had pepper spray. So once we got them outside, we they, they just kept kept talking. And then try to run up on us. We'd we'd made some also. It was a pretty fun job actually. Well, this is like this. I, I, I honestly, I was kind of joking when I asked you this. So is this like a is this like in a bad part of town that you have to resort to leg kicking people and stuff? Well, it was uh, it was one of the. Uh, uh, it's here in Fort Worth. It was one of the more popular. Uh, the the recent spot I worked. Well, the, the spot I worked at. The la recent spot I worked at had um, cops on the weekends when I worked. So that was pretty simple. There was nothing there. Okay. But the one before that was. <laughs> Worked there. I worked at a strip club for about four years. Wow! And, you know, strip club. All you get is just you know the low end trash people <laughs> that <laughs> looking for beer, cheap beers, and they're, they're going in there trying to talk to girls. And when that doesn't work out for them, they they, they resort to wanting to fight somebody. Jeez. So it's always it's always like that. And then you get bartenders who who are getting tipped good money, so they keep over serving these people, and they get drunk, and and you have to you know sometimes you got to do what you got to do. What a mess! Uh, any of these uh, patrons recognize you from the the reality show or the UFC, or was this before the UFC? Oh yeah, um, uh, no, a lot of them are, are recognize me, especially from the Ultimate Fighter, because I worked there for I worked at this particular club for about four years, off and on, and I, I had to deal with them where I would leave and go to camp for two months. And they, they, you know, they would support me, let me go, and then I would come back and be able to be able to get on the schedule again full time, because I'm I was best friends with the general manager there at the time, and uh, I actually lived with him for like a year, so he I was like a second son to him. Oh. So he he was up and let me come and go whenever I wanted and work as many hours as I wanted or, or as few as I wanted as as I needed to for money and stuff. And uh, I was real for the people who was who were regulars there. I was well known and no one really messed with me, but you'd always have guys you know, coming from out of town, you know, and they'd be drunk and <laughs> we'd have to, you know, we'd have to handle up something. I feel like some of the people listening to this show would say, this is a dream job. You get to hang out there every night. You get to see all of these women and stuff. Uh, is that not the case? Cause I feel like a lot of people would actually think that that's a fun job to have. It was, it was fun. It was fun. When I was single, it was real fun. Uh, <laughs> And you know, but at the same time, you're just around a bunch of people that you're, you're nothing like. Like I don't drink. I don't. I drink like twice a year. I don't party. I, I I don't. I don't stay out late. I don't go to clubs on the week. You know, so I was there strictly for money. And then you know, you know, there was you know benefits of, of working there, obviously. But at the same time, <laughs> at the time it got old. You know, it got yeah. old. Like you know, you're in a when you see a half naked woman, you know, if you 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 go there once every six months, it's cool. But you go there every day, you you just kind of get right. You know, just. I get so used to it, it's kind of pointless. It's not even flattering anymore. Yes, yes, I can understand that. Uh, I just saw you were on a fishing trip, and this is a secret. Um, this is a secret interest of mine. I've never gone fishing, but I oh, I want to go fishing. Perhaps we can go sometime. And I saw your pictures on on your social media. You can see Twitter handle right over there, James Vic MMA. Those are some big ass fishes that you guys got. You, I think you were with your girlfriend, right, um, on this trip or yeah. some yeah. And the, what what kind of fishes were those? Those were gigantic. What kind of fish was that? There were catfish. We caught them out of the lake. We we put them. Uh, how we do it? We're, you know, we're, I'm I'm a country dude. We, <laughs> we we put we put trot lines out. So we you, you connect basically. How we do is we 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 you you know you have trees coming up out of the water in in, in lakes and stuff, and you you tie a line to the to the, to the water right below the bottom of the water line. Okay. On the tree, run the line. You'll run the line all the way across, and then you'll drop hooks. Uh, you put a string about that long, about a foot long, two foot long, and you'll run it down and you'll put a hook at the end of it. And by law, you put the, the, the hooks three foot apart. So you'll have this long line and you'll have hooks coming down it. And then you put a weight on it and you sink it to the bottom of the lake. And then you bait the hooks and then you run your lines, you know, two or three times a day, morning and the evening and sometimes midday, depending on how hot the weather is. It's But the weather is pretty good in Texas where it's, it's not too hot, but it's not too cold mm. so right now. So so it's a good, really a good time to fish and you go out there you set the line you bait the line and then you come back a few hours later and you'll run the line you go take someone in the boat two people one of the guy lifts the line and you know two people will lift the line up and you catch a fish on fish me on the line you throw it in the boat take it off and then you rebate the hook 
And then at the end, and you, you say you may have like 10 or 20, 20 hooks going down. From wow. There. So fishing with one pole, which we do that also, fishing with one pole, you, you, if you have two or three, say you have three lines out and you have 20 hooks on each line, you have 60, 60 hooks to catch fish on. So it's, it's, it's a good system. We, we caught probably a good, just, I was out there only a day and a half because I, you know, I took the fight and had to come back. I was planning on staying for a whole week. Oh. My dad and my brother are still out there, but, um, uh, uh, we caught about 40, 40 keepers, and then we skin them all up, hang them in a tree. We skin them, and then uh, uh, batter them up in, in, in cornmeal and fry them and have a big fish fry. Wow. <laughs> what a foreign world to me. Holy moly. I've never experienced anything like that, but it sounds like a great time. That's amazing. Well done. Yeah, those were those were gigantic fish. Um, I asked you about this after the fight, and so forgive me for asking again, but I think you know on, on a different stage here um, – obviously very interesting and, and important to discuss because I remember when you were tweeting about your sister and putting out the, the GoFund page. She is so, so explain to people what she battled through and how she's doing now because it did seem, at least from an outsider, that you know, obviously pretty scary and serious stuff. Yes, sir. She had a, a tumor right here behind her, her skull that it compl had completely eaten her sinus cavity and it was going down to her eyes and they said it was going to make her blind if she didn't take, get it taken out like ASAP. Wow. And... Um, she had insurance, but but um, uh, she had to pay like a huge deductible because the surgery was expensive because they had they had to fly in a doctor all the way from like it, it was either from like Florida or maybe even a foreign country. I don't remember because the, the she got had gotten it done here in Dallas and the neurologist and stuff. I guess that's what, it, what it's called with the, with the brain or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't. Um, they, they they didn't want to do the surgery because they were they were they were scared that, that they were there was complications where where they would mess her brain up because they basically it had, had completely eaten eaten her sinus cavity and her skull it was eroding through the bone like her her bone right here in the forehead was so thin like you could probably punch it and it would have would have caved in it was, wow. it was that it was that soft and so they went in and they they had to, they had to cut a hole out all in there they scalped her from here they peeled the skin down they had to cut all that old rotting decaying bone out they put a titanium plate in there they cleaned the uh the tumor completely out and they uh had her on some like strong medicine uh, like a lot of strong stuff to, to make sure nothing would grow back and they had her after the surgery she had to stay in the hospital for a few days then they had her go home for a couple weeks they had her come back and then they had her do a checkup after that for like every two months for like six months and now it's been in i guess in Ju july i think maybe july or June or August, it'll be a year. And she, she's, she still has um, real bad headaches and stuff because w the way they had to cut her skull and, and cut through her skin and stuff, it's like a lot of, I guess, tissue damage and stuff. It's, and there's a lot of, it's a big scar there. And, and you know, it, it, it pulled it apart and then they had to pull it back together. And she feels like, still feels like nerve and tissue damage there. Wow. But besides that, she, they said that'll eventually go away. It may take a year or two for it to go away. But now she's she, she's it's it's all good and she, it's it's gone and uh, there's hasn't been any signs of it coming back or anything in the last the last ten months or however long it's been. How old is she? She's thirty two. <clears throat> thirty two. She, she has four kids. Wow. And it's, it's rough. Um, from what I understand, she was at your fight, right at one ninety seven. Well, no, I thought she was in my fight when I was talking because oh. she was supposed to come in. The, I didn't get to talk to my family. I, I was texting them back and forth, but I was, you know, busy. So I thought she was supposed to come in the last minute. She couldn't. She could. She realized she couldn't. She couldn't afford to come basically because it was, you know, too far or whatever. Okay. I had a free ticket for her, but because she, you know, she has four kids. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so she. Um, uh, I mean, she has, she's married and everything. And her, you know, her and her husband work, but she. Uh, you know, they have four kids. You got to save money. Of course. So she the last. The last minute she didn't end up coming, so. But she's able but she to. All she's able to live a normal life. Like she's she's fine as far as like living her life and going about her daily stuff, right? That's sorry, she's doing wow. 100% recovery now. That is amazing. Wow. Um, well, I, I wish her all the best. That's uh, that's an unbelievable thing, and I can't imagine what kind of stress that was for for everyone involved, including her. That's uh, that's a pretty incredible story. Um, okay, so so let let us end on this. Um, you said that you really wanted that case of fight. You 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 want him. That's the one you want. If 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 you get through Evan Dunham and they say let's just let's just play this game, Kiesa next or a title shot, which do you take? Oh come on, man. Okay, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna, take the, I'm gonna okay. take the title and then I give him a title shot after. Okay, I just wanted I mean, to know I, how badly you wanted it. 
I want it so bad though. I mean, that's the only other that's the only other fight that I would choose over him is is, is a title fight for sure. But I doubt after after being ranked 14 when I win this fight, I doubt that um I'm getting a title shot. Sure, like, sure. Shot. I just like playing those hypotheticals. You know what I mean? But hey, stranger things have happened. So so. I you still there? Oh, you you swapped on us, but I still see you. See me? Yeah, I see you. Even okay, though yeah. you're, 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 um, there you are. But I gotta think. I mean, you beat Evan Dunham. You're right there, and I mean, I don't think he's too far away from you. So that that might be the time to get on the mic and formally call this guy out. Oh, I was going to, and they didn't give me an interview after my yeah. last fight. Week. What's up with that? I don't know, but then I checked the. I watched the card when I got home, and I guess because all the prelims were decisions, nobody got an interview. So I felt a little better about that. Yeah. What what a card that is. Did you see that card? One ninety nine. It's a tremendous card. Yeah, I saw that. My boy Dominic Cruz is fighting on there. That's right. So I'm happy about that. Your old, uh, your old coach. So, so you leave Texas and then you're going to Maryland to stay with uh, your coach Lloyd Irvin. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm gonna stay there until until basically, you know, until we leave to to head to L.A. Okay. Well, I look forward to it, man. Uh, welcome to the show for the first time. This particular show, great to have you on. Thank you for calling me out. I respect that very much and uh, love the fact that you're getting right back in there and fighting again at UFC 199 against Evan Dunham. What a fight that is. I know a lot of your fans are excited as well. So wish you the best. I, I hope my interview turned out decent. There was some clown, when I, when I tweeted that, some clown on Twitter was like, oh, you're not, you're not uh, charismatic enough to be on air Get at the Hawaii show. Get out of here. <laughs> Don't listen to those people. You actually kind of remind me, you're, you're like a more charismatic version of Donald Cerrone with that accent of yours. You ever get that? <laughs> I'm not, I'm country, but I'm not a cowboy. I don't, That's I've right. never worn a cowboy hat. I really don't know how to ride a horse either. We were too poor to have horses growing up. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell him I said that either. Um, appreciate the time, James. All the best to you, and we'll see you out there in uh, Inglewood, June 4th. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. There he is, James Vick. Amazing. 9-0 and in the UFC, excuse me, 9-0 and overall, and uh, he is 5-0 and in the UFC, and, and people don't talk, don't talk about him enough. It really is amazing. Impressive wins over Ramsey Nijem, Nick Hine, Jake Matthews. Really impressive run thus far in the UFC, but because he has been so inactive and decimated by injuries plagued by injuries he has uh he has kind of fallen out of the spotlight but here he is picked up a win last week well 10 or so days ago nine or so days ago and uh, returning june 4th and look at that card look at ufc 199 it is a very strong card an amazing card